Hi everyone, my name is Malia Bonomo. I'm an Applied Physics PhD candidate at Rice University. And today I'm gonna to talk about some work that I've done in collaboration with the Houston Methodist Center for Performing Arts Medicine. So to get started, I'll begin with just a little bit of the motivation behind this work to better understand how music therapy works. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the theory, so looking at uh, modularity and biology, so I'll explain what that is. Um, I'll describe the experiments we did for this project um, and the analysis methods, and then some of the cool results um, looking at differences um, in people's brains when they listen to different types of music and speech. Um, and then I'll finish by talking about some of the ongoing um, and future projects that we're working on um, in terms of music and, and neural health. So music therapy is effective um, for improving a variety of mental and physical health related outcomes. Um, and especially in terms of um, it's worked for interventions for patients with um, diagnosed within the spectrum disorders of consciousness. Um, and it's led to enhanced arousal um, of um, behavior measures, psychological, or sorry, physiological and, and neural responses. Um, but several questions remain. Um, namely, how is music actually helping the brain? And why is music more effective than listening to audiobooks um, or other speech-based therapies? Um, and also, why is this music intervention um, very strongly across individual participants? Right? For some people, it works very well. For others, there's no response. Um, and so for this particular project, um, we, I'm going to show you some results that help us begin to answer this final question here. Um, as we look at how we can uh, classify um, people's brain states um, as they're processing these different types of music and, and speech um, and see how um, we can maybe look for differences in, in these um, individuals. So to do so, we're using theory um, about uh, modularity and biology. And so modularity is the degree to which um, some components of some complex system can be divided into distinct uh, functioning groups known as modules. And so when we study the brain, um, modularity is determined by comparing the number of links between brain regions um, within a module versus brain regions in other modules. So to illustrate that, um, right, let's say you have, um, you're doing neuroimaging, um, you can divide up the brain into regions, so these, these blue circles here, um, and then based on the activity, um, that's happening in the brain, you can infer a network um, and how these different brain regions are maybe connected to perform different tasks. Um, and then we can calculate the modularity um, and look to see to what extent we can group these brain regions um, into uh, modules. So in this example, we have a, a network with no modularity, um, low modularity, and very high modularity. So in this case, there are not many uh, links between the modules. And so the reason this is important um, and interesting to me is that um, modularity is a more general theory of studying how different systems function um, and how their structure impacts the way that, that function uh, works. And so an analogy that I like to use to describe the sort of the, the importance of this is, um, let's say that you wanted to make a strawberry smoothie. Um, it would be really inefficient if you had to um, put your blender together from scratch every single time that you wanted to make a smoothie, right? It would take you a long time. Um, there's a lot of room for error. Um, but fortunately, your blender is highly modular, um, right? And so you can perform that task really efficiently and really often and really fast. Um, so that's great um, that this modularity helps you perform that task, but what if you have a different task now? Let's say that you are having a party and each of your friends wants a different type of smoothie. Um, well, in that case, um, this single um, highly modular blender might not be as beneficial as a blender uh, with lower modularity. Um, right? In this case, um, where there's some crosstalk between the modules, right? you can use the um, the container to drink from, you can swap different tops and blades as needed, right? And this is helping you perform a more complex task. Um, and so that's what we see in general is that modularity um, in a variety of biological systems has been shown to be valuable on shorter time scales for completing simple tasks, um, but it's more limiting on longer time scales or to complete more longer or more complex tasks. Um, and so that's sort of the motivation here in, in wanting to see um, how this theory matches up with brain activity. So for this experiment, we had um, 25 healthy subjects listen to a variety of uh, music and speech pieces. So one was their favorite song. Um, each subject was asked to select one of these. 
Um, they listened to uh, two other excerpts of music, um, one that was considered culturally familiar to all the participants, so a piece by Bach, um, and another that was culturally unfamiliar, so with um, harmonies and rhythms that um, were not familiar to the participant, um, and we used this Japanese opera. Um, and then we had three speech excerpts. Um, so they listened to, um, so two English speech, speech excerpts, um, one that was very emotionally charged speech from Charlie Chaplin in the Great Dictator film, um, and then also very um, sort of dry, monotone uh, speech um, given, delivered by Walter Cronkite for a newscast. Um, and then to contrast this, we had participants listen to a foreign speech excerpt of Zosa Click. Um, and so this would be, so someone who's not familiar with this language, it'd be difficult for them to pick out any uh, word-like sounds. And so that was a good contrast for um, these other two pieces. And so um, we had these subjects go into MRI scanners. We performed functional imaging um, while they listened to each of these uh, music and speech excerpts. Um, and then from there, we did our network analysis, which I'll explain on, on the next slide. So the idea here is that for each subject, we have their fMRI data um, as they listen to each auditory piece. And so what we do is we divide up their brain into regions. So we use 84 Broban areas, which is a particular way of parcelating the brain. Um, so then we look at what's the signal coming from each of those brain regions over the uh, music piece. So while they're listening to the piece, what is their brain region, what are they doing? Um, and then we're able to calculate the correlations um, between all pairs of brain regions. Um, and this then gives us our network structure. So we binarize this to improve the signal to noise ratio, and then we're able to calculate modularity. Um, and so in this example here, there are four modules of brain regions um, that were uh, found by the algorithm um, based on the grouping of brain regions that have many tightly interacting brain regions, um, lots of links between them. Um, and so I'll go through uh, some of our results now. And um, afterwards, I'll explain a bit more about um, what we see uh, for the, the module compositions of the brain regions. But so first, so we were interested in seeing if we could divide up these participants into two groups. Um, and so we decided to do so based on um, the participants self-selected music. So we use this as, as basically um, kind of like a baseline for how um, someone's brain processes music, right? If we're looking at, at um, their brain when they listen to this, this song that they, they've um, uh, probably listen to often, they probably have a strong emotional attachment to. And so we divide up the group based on the cohort based on those who had lower modularity during their self-selected song and those who had higher modularity during their self-selected song. Um, and so this was um, at the uh, cutoff at the cohort average of 0.43. I should mention the, the value of modularity is between zero and one, um, where one is a completely modular network, meaning that you have these groups of brain regions that have no connections to, to other modules, um, whereas a modularity of zero means that the network is completely random. We don't see any of this modular structure. So, and interestingly, what we found was that a subject's modularity during their self-selected piece of music um, was predictive of their brain state during other auditory pieces. So, for instance, we looked at um, the change in modularity. So, um, basically, right from their self-selected piece to the other auditory pieces, how did the modular structure change? And so, for the low uh, modularity group, we saw significant changes um, during um, the two um, speech pieces, more so during Chaplin, um, during the familiar um, Bach music, and also during the unfamiliar um, Zosa Click, the, the foreign language piece. Um, whereas during the high modularity group, we only saw significant differences um, during the unfamiliar pieces, so both the unfamiliar music and speech. Um, and so this is a really interesting result um, because it also matches up with, uh, it's consistent with network theory in general, um, which is that um, uh, networks that have higher modularity are more robust to perturbations, um, right? Meaning that, uh, for instance, these subjects with higher modularity, right, it takes a more unfamiliar, a more novel stimulus to actually cause changes in the network, 
right? Otherwise, it's very stable. Um, and so this might have implications for how uh, certain subjects, certain patients respond to music therapy, right? It could be that patients who have higher modularity, they may require more novel set music um, in order to actually encourage neuroplasticity. Um, but that's, that remains to be studied, but it's definitely an interesting um, extension of this result. So the other, other thing I want to talk about was uh, module compositions. So this is um, analyzing the different brain regions that are grouped into modules uh, to maximize the modularity calculation. So um, what we have, I just have one example here of, of the networks um, for during the self-selected piece. Um, and so just to pull out some important brain regions, what I've highlighted here, um, so this is um, the axial view, right, orienting you um, to the um, subjects back, front, and, and their right and left. Um, and um, the same view then in coronal and, and sagittal. And the yellow are brain regions that are key for sensory motor function. Um, the uh, red regions are key brain areas involved in visual processing. Um, the blue here, these are brain regions involved in auditory processing. Um, the green are emotion. And um, the tan here are brain regions involved in the default mode network. And this is the network that's particularly active, right, when you're not doing any tasks, right? It's the default uh, network is where it gets the name from. And so to, to look at now the differences between the two groups, um, interestingly, we do see um, these brain regions um, sort of crop up in, in particular modules. So for example here, so we have the high modularity group um, and uh, consistent among all of the, the music types, we have these general modules of um, the auditory brain regions, the, the visual brain regions, the somatosensory um, emotion and the default mode network. Um, and this is fairly consistent um, across uh, all of the, the music uh, and speech pieces. Although we do see differences in the connections between the modules, uh, the connections between the brain regions and therefore the connections within the modules versus between the modules. Um, and so this has some implications for why the modularity is different. Um, but interestingly, if we now compare this to the low modularity group, so I'll just go forward for a second. This is the low back to the high and to the low high and back to the low group again. Um, and if you can, and if you noticed, but basically um, this is consistent with the results I previously talked about where the uh, low modularity group had more dynamic networks, whereas those in the high modularity group um, have more stable network structure. So the, the modules are, are more consistent, uh, especially during the self-selected piece, during the culturally familiar Bach, um, Chaplin and, and Cronkite. And then we do start to see the differences um, a bit more in Gagaku and Click, although not so much um, even there. Uh, whereas those in the low modulated group, we do see um, significant changes um, between the familiar um, speech and, and unfamiliar music, right? So we're seeing um, a bigger difference, at least qualitatively, in, in the module compositions. And this is something that we're looking into further to better understand uh, which brain regions are in which modules and what, that, what the implications are for how the, the brain is functioning to process uh, the music and speech. So uh, that's some, some ongoing work there. But so just to summarize, so the, the main idea and, and the, the take home results here, right? So the idea was that we had subjects listen to a favorite song and we used that to classify them into high and low modularity networks. And then we looked at how their brains responded when listening to other music and speech excerpts that varied in terms of cultural familiarity and emotivity. And we found that those in the high, mod high modularity group, excuse me, had more stable network organization overall, and they really only adapted during the unfamiliar pieces. Whereas those in the low modularity group had more dynamic networks, they adapted to process both the culturally familiar and unfamiliar pieces. Um, and um, so that was the, the sort of the major difference between the two groups. And to bring this back to our blender analogy to uh, really drive home the, the interesting results, uh, interesting part of the th theoretical results here, 
right? So if you think about, you have your high modularity blender, um, so that would need to uh, adapt, right? If you brought it to an unfamiliar foreign country, right? You'll need some sort of adapter, for example, to, to be able to plug it in and use. Um, whereas your low modularity blender, um, yes, it would need to adapt um, in the unfamiliar uh, uses, right? But it'll also need to adapt during the familiar uh, uses, um, right, as well. So we see this, um, again, the, the modularity of the system has implications for um, the, how that system will be adapting to perform both familiar and unfamiliar tasks, in this particular case, uh, listening to different types of music and speech. So in the last couple of minutes, I just want to tell you a little bit about some of the cool ongoing work and future work um, that we have um, going on. So um, one thing that we're working on now is we're quantifying the impact of a creative music intervention on brain function and health uh, for patients with mild cognitive impairment and also adults over 70. And so basically we have um, these participants um, engage in a six week music course um, where we image their brains before and after. Um, also at the end of the course, there's a, a concert. So this was um, some pictures from our first cohort. Uh, they finished up um, in, in March, uh, luckily right before um, everything started shutting down from the, the pandemic. Um, but so, and what we're in the process of doing now is starting to analyze the data from that first cohort. And we're interested in seeing if we can um, quantify any differences in their uh, brain function and cognition um, as a result of uh, participating in this course. Um, and hopefully this um, has implications for um, how music um, can help as a, as a therapeutic um, intervention um, when teamed up with um, traditional medical treatments. Um, so this is some ongoing work. Uh, like I said, you can check for project updates at our website, um, arches.rice.edu. Um, and so we're really excited about uh, what we're um, uh, researching here. Um, the second uh, project, this is more of a future work um, that um, applying for funding to, to do now. Um, but so uh, I've been studying a lot of how the brain is processing music. Um, but an interesting question is how is uh, the ear encoding the uh, sound signal um, and sending it as a neural signal to your brain right before your brain is able, even able to, to perceive and, and process that. Um, and so it's, I think it's really taken for granted the intricate way in which uh, your cochlea and your inner ear um, has this mapping of uh, frequency along a uh, spiral shape um, and how that's able to encode um, both simple stimuli, right, just me talking to you, right, it's a very uh, simple uh, sound stimulus, has a clear meaning, um, right, but it's also, your cochlea is also able to process things as complex and abstract as music, right, where there's several simultaneous pitches and instrument mixtures, and your, your cochlea is able to encode all of that in such a way that your brain can then process and perceive um, these different musical elements. Um, and so one part of this project will be modeling uh, music processing in the cochlea um, and uh, seeing if we can just better have a better idea of how that's happening and, and how that's different than just processing um, speech. Um, and then the second part of this project is seeing how we can apply this um, to then improve music perception in cochlear implant users. Uh, so cochle cochlear implants are a great tool, a great invention um, for helping to restore hearing to those who are uh, deaf or have hearing impairment. Um, and it's really great at encoding speech signals and providing that as useful information for the brain to process. Um, but it is lacking in how it encodes music. And so music appreciation and comprehension um, is a, a big um, difficulty for cochlear implant users. And so we're hoping that um, by doing some of this modeling work to better understand how the cochlea is actually uh, processing music, um, we can uh, help to improve the way that these cochlear implants are stimulating, stimulating the cochlea and um, encoding the, the sound and hopefully improve uh, music appreciation in cochlear implant users. So, and that's again, uh, future work. Um, so definitely um, you can follow me on Twitter to, to get updates about that. So with that, I just want to thank my collaborators at the Houston Methodist Center for Performing Arts Medicine, um, also in the Rice uh, School of Music, and um, just want to thank my funding sources, and thank you to all of you for your attention. Um, please uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Uh, thank you for watching this talk. Good morning to everyone. 
I am Gabriele Penazzi from the Department of uh, Psychology and Cognitive Science of the University of Trento and member of the research project Voluntary versus Mechanical Stimulation of the Olfactory Epithelium, a functional MRI study um, made in collaboration with the Department of uh, Surgery, Medical, Molecular and uh, critical area pathology of the University of Pisa. In this presentation I will uh, explain some preliminary results uh, about uh, uh, the functional brain activity in altered states of consciousness induced by mechanical stimulation of the olfactory epithelium, which are part uh, uh, are results uh, part of a wider fMRI study uh, at the discovery of the neurophysiological mechanisms uh, underlying the induction of meditative states by the practice of controlled breathing techniques which uh, slow down the natural breathing rhythm. An aspect which is common in uh, several meditation practices and controlled breathing techniques um, is uh, the attention given to a slow paced breathing um, acted through the nose. In particular, the corpus of breathing practices from the millenary Eastern tradition uh, of pranayama gives a special attention to the rhythm of inspiration, expiration and uh, all the respiratory cycle, which is different among uh, the several uh, techniques used to reach uh, different uh, consciousness states. Uh, our research team developed uh, a specific study which uh, principal aim is to shed light on the effects induced by the mechanical uh, artificial uh, stimulation of the olfactory epithelium for 15 minutes uh, on the state of consciousness and uh, metabolic brain activity of the 16 uh, volunteers which took part to the study. Um, the stimulation was made through air insufflated into the nasal vault uh, by the use of a specific uh, device built specifically for this study. Let's start with a few words about the literature and the scientific background that led us to realize this experiment. Um, concerning the study of the olfactory system, the neuroscientific uh, research um, commonly uh, focused his interest on the chemoreceptorial uh, properties of the uh, olfactory receptors. Um, as the, the identification of the odors uh, and the sense of smell. But, however, in uh, literature it's uh, starting to grow the attention uh, on the mechanical properties of the nasal receptors linked to the perception of the air flowing through uh, the nostrils. In fact, uh, looking at the graph from uh, the work of uh, Zelano and uh, colleagues uh, published in 2016, um, which uh, used the intracranial EEG um, to record the electrical activity in uh, different uh, brain areas of epileptic patients, uh, it is possible uh, to see how the electrical activity of uh, some olfactory and uh, even limbic areas is modulated um, by uh, in phase with the respiratory cycle. This kind of effect, which can be called uh, respiratory uh, entrainment, has been measured just if the act of breathing was made by nose, as you can see in the left uh, column of the graph, and was not present if the respiration was made by mouth. Another basic experiment which can be considered the starting point for uh, the development of our present work is the study published by Andrea Pierulli and the colleagues of the University of Pisa in 2018. 
which investigated with EEG uh, the uh, effects of the rhythmic mechanical uh, stimulation of the olfactory epithelium with the use of the same slow-paced rhythm used in uh, our current experimental part in consisting in 8 seconds of uh, continuous uh, stimulation of the olfactory epithelium with uh, air flowing through the nose, uh, through the nostrils, and uh, 12 seconds without stimulation for a total period of uh, 15 minutes. This uh, study shows how this kind of stimulation is able to induce a significant enhancement of uh, delta and theta uh, brain waves over uh, the wall uh, cortex involving uh, uh, mainly the limbic system and uh, default modern network structures. Uh, even if uh, this pioneering uh, study left unsolved a lot of questions uh, and among them uh, how to interpret this kind of effects uh, on the light of fMRI data. So we developed uh, this uh, experiment which uh, is, uh, to our knowledge, uh, uh, the first experiment present in literature to study the effects uh, of mechanical uh, uh, artificial uh, and continuative stimulation of the olfactory epithelium on humans um, with uh, uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging. For the study have been used the following uh, methodological instruments. Uh, the um, subjective state uh, of consciousness of the participants has been measured uh, uh, with the use of the phenomenology of consciousness inventory. Uh, which is a retrospective self-report questionnaire able to quantify the um, subjective uh, experience of the participants. And uh, the um, brain activity was, uh, has been investigated with uh, fMRI uh, in resting state sessions acquired at the MRI lab of the Center for Mind Brain Sciences of the University of Trento. In this image is represented the uh, stimulation uh, protocol developed uh, for the study. Starting from the left, uh, you can see represented the air tank um, uh, full of uh, compressed air, not oxygen, just air, uh, which was connected uh, uh, to a polymeric pipe uh, on his turn uh, connected to uh, polymeric uh, medical nasal cannulae which were inserted into the participant nostrils by a um, specialized uh, doctor, a uh, notolaryngologist um, because uh, the cannula needed to uh, be inserted uh, very deeply in order to uh, correctly stimulate the olfactory epithelium. Um, the air passing from the air tank to the participant nostrils was uh, modulated by a device built specifically for the study um, which uh, had an electrovalve able to modulate the flow of air stimulate, letting the air flow for 8 seconds uh, till the participant nostrils uh, and uh, blocking uh, the, the air flow for, uh, um, the, for 12 seconds in uh, a, a cycle of uh, 20 seconds um, which was repeated for 15 minutes while the participants were laying down uh, with closed eyes. Here in this uh, Images you can see all the complexities uh, and uh, the methodological uh, issues we had to solve uh, in order uh, to act this complex uh, experimental paradigm and the stimulation protocol. Um, so uh, to the right you can see the air tank that needed to be uh, put quite far away um, from the magnetic field of the uh, magnetic resonance uh, imaging uh, uh, device um, and uh, uh, 
as, as you can see in the picture in the middle, uh, another problem we have to solve is to regulate the um, air pressure flowing into the nostrils uh, in order to set it uh, just above the perceptual threshold of the participants. Um, down uh, in the image uh, at the bottom you can see uh, the, uh, the device able to modulate the airflow uh, at the rhythm uh, the zoomed by uh, pranayama practices. This image represents our experimental design. The participants were left 15 minutes in a state of awake and rest, uh, laying down into the scan room without any kind of task. After this period, the session A of functional data was acquired while the participant was in a resting state condition with closed eyes. Then the medical doctor in the scan room inserted the nasal cannula into the participant nostrils and the participant was stimulated for 15 minutes with the stimulation protocol explained before with uh, 8 seconds of stimulation with uh, air puffed into the nostrils and 12 seconds without stimulation for a total period of 15 minutes while naturally breathing by mouth at his natural pace. After this period of stimulation, the session B was acquired uh, in, in always in a resting state condition. In the end, the participant was uh, led uh, out of the scan room for uh, the phenomenology of consciousness inventory uh, feeling. Let's uh, have a look to the first results uh, we found. The first uh, surprising results we collected are the phenomenology of consciousness uh, inventory uh, results. Uh, we compared the, the results collected after the session B acquired in the MRI lab uh, with results of the same questionnaire collected after a period of normal rest in another moment outside the MRI lab as a control condition. After the mechanical stimulation of the olfactory epithelium, the self-report questionnaire showed the perception of the participants of being in an altered state of consciousness. It is present a strong expansion in uh, the sense of time and uh, the emergence of uh, spiritual and meaningful thoughts, uh, which uh, are characteristics proper of uh, meditation and uh, other contemplative practices. Um, and they, uh, with the aim to put the attention on uh, being here and now in the present, um, and uh, can get the practitioner closer to a contemplative and uh, spiritual state of mind. Uh, so uh, it is. Uh, it is, as it has been uh, firstly assumed by Sober, who investigated uh, in rats the mechanical properties of the olfactory epithelium, the slow-paced mechanical stimulation of the olfactory epithelium in humans can be a bottom-up trigger able on its own to modulate consciousness states in breathing techniques and meditative practices. This assumption can have uh, important implications in the study of the neurophysiology of control and breathing exercises, which involve more parameters than uh, the top-down modulation of the attention uh, that is usually uh, the main investigated. Here in this table you can see uh, the results of uh, some statistics uh, about uh, the uh, most uh, effective uh, uh, results uh, um, uh, in the dimension of the phenomenology of consciousness inventory uh, uh, which have been uh, affected most by the stimulation protocol. It has been made a paired t-test and uh, in the right column you can see um, the um, correction for multiple comparison 
because in green uh, are presented the results uh, uh, significative after a false discovery rate uh, correction. Regarding the functional data, it has been made a first explorative uh, functional connectivity analysis uh, which uh, um, measure the correlation coefficient uh, of the intrinsic bold activity of different brain regions with the assumption that areas with uh, similar uh, bold fluctuations are part of the same functional network. In literature are present evidences of an increase in functional connectivity uh, between uh, amygdala and frontal regions after the practice of uh, exercise with attention to breathe, typical of different uh, open uh, monitoring uh, meditation practices and protocols like, uh, for example, mm, the mindfulness protocol. Um, we found uh, similar results after the uh, stimulation, uh, artificial mechanical stimulation of the olfactory epithelium, an augmented functional connectivity between uh, amygdala, especially left amygdala, and uh, um, um, voxels that uh, here are represented in red, uh, mainly concentrated in the left frontal pole. Um, uh, as uh, um, as uh, Zelano and the colleagues uh, evidenced uh, in uh, their experiment uh, with uh, intracranial EEG uh, recording of uh, electrical brain activity, uh, we found uh, a modulation in uh, the metabolic activity, in uh, the functional connectivity of uh, other um, limbic areas like uh, the left thalamus and the right hippocampus uh, that taken as seeds uh, show modulation in parietal and uh, occipital areas. Uh, another characteristic which is evidenced in literature and in meta-analysis about the brain areas metabolically more active during the different meditation techniques is the involvement of right anterior supramarginal gyrus in focused attention meditation practices which usually put the attentional focus on controlled breathing as uh, the starting point to reach a present meditative uh, state of consciousness. Some authors identify this area with a sensation of disembodiment. Uh, the inferior parietal lobule uh, is uh, an area uh, studied also in the out-of-body experiences, for example. Um, and uh, taking in account uh, the subjective sensation of several participants of our study, uh, uh, after the stimulation um, that presented the sensation to have a kind of anesthetized uh, arms uh, and uh, subtle um, proprioceptive alterations, uh, we found uh, a similar effect uh, in the uh, modulation of uh, functional connectivity uh, as uh, it's possible to see in the image to the right. Um, taking the right anterior promarginal gyrus uh, as uh, a seed for uh, ROI to ROI uh, functional connectivity analysis. Another area which in literature is associated with the perception of the flow of time and the temporal uh, duration is the right inferior frontal gyrus. Uh, our phenomenological reports uh, so showed uh, an intense alteration in this uh, subjective uh, sensation. And also in functional data we found a massive modulation of functional connectivity values uh, taking uh, the inferior frontal gyrus as seed, as you can see in the image in the middle. <coughs> so, uh, 
These uh, first preliminary results uh, show how the mechanical stimulation of the olfactory epithelium at a uh, certain slow rhythm taken uh, from uh, pranayama practices is able to induce an alteration in the state of consciousness uh, of the participants and a significant modulation in the functional connectivity of cortical and subcortical brain areas. Our SH research team aims uh, to develop uh, a neurophysiological model of non-ordinary states of consciousness induced by briefing techniques, taking into account uh, three factors that, uh, in our opinion, are crucial for the induction of uh, meditative states in breathing techniques. The slowing down of a breathing uh, rhythm the involvement of top-down voluntary attention to the task and uh, the rhythmical mechanical stimulation of the olfactory epithelium. Uh, the current uh, results that uh, I have presented today can help us to better understand the role of this uh, third factor on the neurophysiological mechanisms underlying this kind of practices. I want to give thanks to the research team which give birth to uh, this research problem uh, project uh, and, uh, and I want to, to give my thanks to you for your attention. Dear audience, I'm going to talk about the hierarchical system of the functional brain revealed by intracranial EEG. Uh, I am Dong Zhiyang, a neurologist working in Shanwu Hospital in China. My research of interest includes architecture of the functional brain, non-invasive brain stimulation, and high-frequency oscillation. The work I'm going to talk today has not been um, published and it is in preparation. So collaboration and discussion from any one of you is welcome. I can be reached at least two emails. And the object was to explore the neural reorganization re pattern with delay matching task. Our lab has studied the discrimination representation with delay matching task for a long time. In the earliest study, we found that inconsistency between conditions can result in a negative component centered around 270 milliseconds. And in the following experiments, we have found that this component existed regardless of the content, whether the participant distinguishing to uh, quantitative value of two numbers or distinguishing the shape and the color difference of two pictures. This component can be detected anyway. We also explore the influence of the attention on this processing. And in these experiments, pictures with color or shape feature were presented, and participants were asked to distinguish in the consistency between S1 and S2, whether with focus on one of the features. We find that task relevant mismatch these lines or the conditions differed in features being attended, showing the highest amplitude. And this suggested that attention augmented this processing. And we have also found that discrimination representation involved a distributed network, repeating the number of uh, the number delay matching task with SEG data. And these pictures illustrated that the regions showing a difference on amplitude between conditions with the very first time, that is within 200 and 205. 50 millisecond was mainly in bilateral insular cortex. However, with with time going on, more regions participated in discrimination representation, and within about five five millisecond, almost the whole brain has been recruited and finished the processing. So it seems that the brain responded ex uh, extensively and quickly. Uh, in this report, um, the uh, picture with shape and borderline feature was used, and uh, there were four conditions named ND and uh, no difference, and BD borderline difference, SD and the shape difference, and DD represented for dual difference. Um, there were four conditions in this experiment. Um, participants were patients with epilepsy who has implanted SEG for pre-surgical evaluation. 
Um, participants were asked, asked to perform three tasks and make decisions on whether S1 and S2 was consistent in shape or borderline. Uh, in task A, they were attempted to shape and ignore borderline feature. Task B, and borderline was attended and the shape feature was ignored. And in task C, both feature was, uh, was attended. Neural scan was used to acquire data with sample rate up to kHz, um, pre-processing including rejection filter and baseline collection correction and uh, average was performed using MEDAP and EasyLab. Um, for statistic analysis, time of interest was set uh, and was set for 600 milliseconds after the onset of S2, and analysis of variance were used to compare the amplitude between conditions with FDR correction. These lines represented uh, the ERP for ERP conditions. And we also define the function of the electrodes with two steps. For step one, we first define the discrimination period. If there was a consecutive period, period during which uh, ND showed significant difference with SD, however, ND did not different with BD, then this period will be labeled as shape discrimination period. Similarly, borderline discrimination period will be labeled. For dual discrimination period, uh, ND significantly differed both with SD and BD was required. And for step two, we classify the electrodes into one of the four functions. Shape discrimination function means that there was only shape discrimination period and during this uh, whole 600 millisecond. Similarly, borderline discrimination function also means purely um, borderline discrimination period existed in this time of interest. And no discrimination means there was no discrimination period for the whole time of interest. And for dual discrimination function, there were two situations. First, if there was dual discrimination period, it will be labeled as dual discrimination function. And uh, second, if there was one time shape discrimination period and another time borderline discrimination period, it will be also labeled as dual discrimination function. We further define the um, function of the electrodes into active or automatic. automatic. Uh, for example, if the electrode was labeled as function, uh, shape discrimination function in task A, then it was defined as active. Uh, and if the uh, electrode was labeled as borderline discrimination function in task A, it was automatic. Um, we also define the onset of discrimination function as the onset that is the very first time showing discrimination. Um, and for structure analysis, individualized post CT concentration to individualized pre operative MRI and uh, detection of the electrodes was performed uh, and the electrodes were concentrated to an MRI template, leaving out electrodes in web matter SSF and electrodes with epileptic disturbances. And finally, 22 participants fully uh, finished all three tasks were enrolled and for the accuracy, the condition differed in the feature that was asked to be ignored showed the lowest accuracy and uh, patients responded fastest for condition for ND condition. And this maps represent shows the distribution of four functions in each task. And we find that uh, electrodes labeled as four discrimination function existed in all three tasks and actuals with active discrimination function exceeded those with automatic discrimination function that is um, 116 actuals showing shape discrimination and this exceeded um, actuals showing borderline discrimination in task A and 17 exceeded 41 in task B. 
and the special distribution of shape discrimination function was was wi widely and uh, however for borderline discrimination function um, it was more locally and uh, primarily located in the left la lateral temporal region we studied the functional reorganization between shape attended task and dual attended task and so, uh, as this table shows that there were more than 200 electrodes they show no discrimination function in task A and uh, about 70% of them stayed still as no discrimination function in task C however 33 of them started to exaggerate dual discrimination function in task C and they were labeled in yellow and they distributed uh, most frequently in right anterior insula and the right dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and there was also a transition into um, shape or borderline discrimination uh, similarly for the electrodes labeled as shape discrimination in shape attended task they whether stay the same or transition into uh, dual discrimination or no discrimination uh, function in task C and uh, similarly for electrodes labeled as borderline discrimination function in task A they will stay the same or transition into uh, dual discrimination or no discrimination and uh, similarly and for electrodes labeled as dual discrimination function in task A uh, about 59% uh, of them remained as uh, dual discrimination function in task C and uh, uh, interestingly there were 16 that is 15% of them changed into no discrimination Uh, we also study the transition from task B into task C. That is, there were more than 200 electrodes showing no discrimination in task B, and about 66% of them stayed still as no discrimination in task C. Uh, and uh, 43, that is, 60% of them changed into dual discrimination task or uh, or 12 and 4% of them changed into shape of borderline discrimination task and uh, similarly um, the transition of no discrimination into dual discrimination uh, located uh, mainly in right anterior insula and also lateral prefrontal cortex mm -hmm. uh, similarly the transition from shape discrimination function into uh, into uh, no discrimination function, borderline discrimination function, or um, dual discrimination function was detected. And the transition from borderline discrimination function into uh, shape, dual, or no discrimination function and uh, state uh, as the same was also detected. Mm. About 65% of the electrodes showing dual discrimination function in task B stayed the same in task, task C and uh, there was also a transition into no discrimination or single feature discrimination mm. um, to summary we focus on electrodes with no, no discrimination function in single feature attended task and their transition into dual, dual feature attended task and that is there were about 70% of them in task A and 66% of them in, them in task B um, will stay still as no discrimination in task C however that means about 30% of them will be further in, recruited in a more complex task we also focus on the electrodes with active function, function active function in single feature attended task um, we find that about 20% of them both in task A and task B 
will stay as the same function in task C. And uh, however, however, for about 35 or 37 percent of them will change into dual discrimination function in task C. And uh, more interestingly, about 30 percent of them will change into no discrimination function. This uh, I think this reflects the stability and the flexibility of our brain. Based on these findings, we're trying to classify the functional, the function of the brain, uh, by the by two factors, and that is their dependency on attention and their specificity to content. We first arbitrarily parcelated the brain and selected only regions with more than ten electrons explored. And then we define the function of the region based on the function rate. The function rate was labeled uh, using a semi quantitative method. If the function rate was less than 5%, it will be labeled as negative, and a 1 plus uh, will be labeled if the function rate is, is within 5 to 20%, and 2 plus means 20 to 40%, and uh, 3 plus means. Uh, 30 to 100%. So this very complex, very complex table uh, uh, shows the the result of the classification, and uh, these three regions um, they can distinguish both shape or borderline uh, in in both shape or or borderline attended task. So they were attention independent and. Uh, feature and specific. However, for these six regions, they can distinguish borderline, uh, uh, they can distinguish shape difference uh, in borderline attended task. So they were attention independent and the shape specific. How, uh, however, for these regions, they can detect, detect the borderline difference in shape attended task. However, they could not uh, distinguish shape difference in borderline attended task. So this was uh, attention independent and borderline specific. Uh, on the contrary, these three regions, they can distinguish shape or borderline difference only with attention. So they were attention dependent and feature unspecific. And for this region, um, it can distinguish shape difference were only with attention and could not distinguish borderline difference uh, with attention. So it was attention dependent and, uh, and shape specific. Similarly, attention dependent and the borderline spe specific error was also detected. So the functional brain was classified into two layers and two categories and um, that is the first first layer first category 1a uh, include regions in the right uh, in the right right posterior temporal and lateral temporal and basal temporal and the posterior frontal cortex they were activated independent of attention and feature and specific to be um, attention independent, however, feature specific error, and this this uh, includes the most mostly distributed error of the brain. Um, however, for two A, that is feature feature and specific, however, attention dependent. They located mainly in the left hemisphere, include lateral and basal temporal lobe and the left posterior insula. And for the attention dependent and the feature specific area, they are located mainly in the right anterior insula and the right middle middle frontal jumbles. We also study the time processing of shape discrimination and uh, um, borderline discrimination function. There was a tendency of posterior to um, inferior tendency. Um, we find the functional brain operating discrimination 
um, show the reorganization pattern with respect to the task demand. The reorganization pattern can be revealed according to the relationship of attention, dependency, and the content specificity. Regions activated independent of attention and content unspecific show right hemisphere superiority. This automatic activated error may correspond to the concept of mismatch not and then uh, well, the ERP component. The attention system and the visual pathway has long been described. However, the interaction of these two systems has been reported less frequently. And I think that this interaction will be very important in revealing the vertical of the functional brain. We found that the error recruited was very distributed uh, widely in discrimination representation. This might be caused by the by that we using a high special and temporal resolution method. And there was very interesting phenomenon of a um, certain function in transition into no function from a single feature task into a complex task. Our study emphasized the stability and flexibility of the brain and limited in isolation of the context. Um, thank you for your attention and I welcome any discussion from one of you. Hello, my name is Dr. Logan Trujillo. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at Texas State University. I'm here to present some work conducted in collaboration with Dr. Richard Morley, an assistant professor in the School of Social Work at Texas State University. The title of my talk is Objective Self-Awareness and Predictive Coding, a Useful Theoretical Framework for Understanding the Role of Consciousness in Violent Behavior. We are all familiar with the perennial social problem of violent behavior. It leads to a large number of violent victimizations that are committed each year. It incurs substantial financial costs to world governments. And it incurs substantial socio-emotional and physical costs to victims of violence. Thus, there is a continuing need to understand the roots of violence in order to predict, reduce, and intervene in violent behavior. We are currently approaching this problem by trying to understand the conscious and unconscious neurocognitive processes that underlie violent behavior. Our approach is based in evolutionary theories of consciousness, as well as a psychological theory called objective self-awareness theory. The basic idea is that conscious awareness facilitates the mental comparison between and prediction of the world's self and behavior. Violence arises from a loss of self-awareness and a subsequent failure to compare and predict one's own mental states and behavior. The idea of a comparison prediction function of consciousness is based in evolutionary theories of consciousness, where consciousness must have an adaptive function in order to have evolved in the first place. Comparison and prediction is argued by many of these theories to be such functions. For example, a conscious comparison between unconscious mental predictions of world states and the perception of the actual state of the world can be useful to implement goal-oriented behavioral adjustments. A predictive function for consciousness can have a social value in that it allows us to predict the behaviors of others by showing us what it could be like to be them. Indeed, some have argued that this social function was the original function of consciousness, but over time it evolved to become useful for other forms of mental activity and behavior. Thus, on these views, consciousness is a form of self-reflexive insight, an inner eye, whose field of view is the mind and brain itself. Now, the psychological theory upon which our approach is based is called objective self-awareness theory. And this theory assumes that violence reflects a failure of self-regulation of behavior. These self-regulation failures arise from a loss of objective self-awareness. What is subjective self-awareness? According to the theory, individuals possess three components. The first is self-awareness, which is a state of conscious awareness of oneself. The second is an ideal self, which is a cognitive model that describes the self as expressing exemplary thought, emotion, and behavior according to culturally determined standards. 
And the third component is an actual self, a cognitive model that reflects how one actually thinks, feels, and behaves as an embodied self-agent. Objective self-awareness is then awareness of how well the current state of the actual self matches the ideal self-state. Normally, a person with objective self-awareness constrains their mental and behavioral states such that the actual self conforms to the predictions of the ideal self. However, this process is not perfect, and sometimes life events produce or highlight discrepancies between the two self-models. This can induce a negative self-evaluation in some individuals and subsequent negative affect and emotion. This then produces a conflicting mental state, which may be resolved by changing the actual self to conform with the ideal self or vice versa. However, this conflicting mental state may also be resolved by avoiding the conflict altogether through loss of objective self-awareness. This involves a loss of awareness of the ideal self and or the discrepancy between the actual and ideal selves. In the state of low self-awareness, individuals ignore their internal world to attend and respond to external stimuli which are perceived as highly salient and external threats are often perceived as exaggerated. This increases the likelihood of self-regulation failure and subsequent violent behavior, especially in response to physically or emotionally threatening situations. So to recap, the state of objective self-awareness reflects a process of consciously comparing one's mental and behavioral states to those predicted by the ideal self. What kind of brain processing might correlate with objective self-awareness? The possibility we are considering in our work is predictive brain processing. This is the idea that a neurocognitive system is constantly generating and updating hypotheses in order to predict environmental input at different levels of abstraction. Predictive processing accounts for our ability to create perceptions from stimuli that can be interpreted in more than one way. For example, suppose you are hiking through the forest and you encounter this scene depicted on the screen. And you have to determine if these brown oblong shapes are sticks or snakes. Predictive processing allows one to make this determination through the use of a likelihood principle. The principle that objects are perceived based on what is most likely to have caused the pattern. The use of a likelihood principle during the brain's predictive processing has led to the hypothesis that the brain predicts environmental input through Bayesian inference. Bayesian inference is a statistical technique that combines prior beliefs about the probability of possible causes of an event with the likelihood of the causes of an event to reach a perceptual conclusion or posterior belief about the most likely cause of the event. Bayesian inference can be described by a mathematical formula called Bayes' rule that relates the probabilities of states of variables hidden in the environment to probabilities of sensory or perceptual observations. Importantly, these probabilities are conditional on a model the brain creates of its environment called the generative model. The brain model generates observations by modeling hidden causes of those observations that are inherent in, but not directly evident from, the pattern of observations. This model is probabilistically represented within the brain, and it can be described by a probability distribution called a generative distribution. The generative model results from the brain organizing itself to reflect the causal and structural regularities of its environment, so as to predict and oppose changes that disrupt homeostasis. And neurophysiologically, this model is realized in terms of predictive activity across the different levels of the brain's recurrent neural hierarchy. As shown in the figure here, the brain is divided into low, intermediate, and high-level processing regions, each with different neural units some that predict input into that region through feedback connections, others which provide feed-forward input into 
and within a region to implement air correction. The predictive units are sometimes called deep units because they exist in deep layers of the cortex, whereas the predictive units are sometimes called superficial units because they exist within superficial layers of the cortex. The higher levels of the brain predict through feedback connections the feed forward input at lower levels, which in turn reflect the input from even lower levels of this hierarchy. And activity cycles across the hierarchy until prediction error is minimized at all the levels, where prediction error is simply the difference between the input signal and the prediction signal. The generative model is used to minimize the brain's surprise. This is the difference between the brain's current and predicted states. So, for example, as shown on the left, if the brain predicts its brown oblong observation to be a stick, and the observation actually reflects a stick, then the brain's free energy will be low. But if, as shown on the right, the brain predicts its brown oblong observation to be a stick, but the observ observation actually reflects a snake, then the brain's free energy will be high. However, there's a problem in that direct computation of surprise is computationally intractable for the brain. This is because the brain is trying to uh, estimate variables that are hidden in the environment. The brain does not have direct access to them. And these hidden variables have parameters that can take on a very large numbers of states. So the solution to this is for the brain to minimize a different quantity called free energy. Free energy is an information theoretic property of the brain that is more tractable to compute than surprise. It forms an upper bound on surprise. So minimizing free energy also minimizes surprise. Now there are two ways in which an embodied brain may minimize its free energy and thus its surprise. The first is for the brain to change its beliefs in order to better predict its perceptions. For example, as shown on the left, if the brain predicts its brown oblong observation to be a stick, but the observation actually reflects a snake, then the brain's free energy will be high. But if instead, as shown on the right, the brain changes its model to predict the observation to be a snake, then free energy will be low. The second way an embodied brain can minimize its free energy is to act on the world to make observations be in accordance with this belief. This is a process called active inference. So for example, if as shown on the left, the brain predicts its observations to be a stick, but the observations actually reflect a snake, then the brain's free energy will be high. But the brain could then implement an action of some kind, such as to run away from the snake to a safer location where brown oblong objects are more likely to be sticks rather than snakes. And then the brain's free energy will be low. Predictive perception and the free energy principle have been used to computationally model or analyze multiple facets of perception, cognition, and action. And I have listed here several examples of this. In this presentation, we suggest that objective self-awareness theory describes a case of predictive processing in the free energy principle where the predictive models are equivalent to the ideal self and the predictive states are equivalent to the actual self. However, in this combined objective self-awareness theory predictive processing framework, there are now three ways in which an embodied brain may change its free energy and surprise. The first is for the brain to change its beliefs in order to better predict its perceptions. So for example, as shown on the left, if the brain predicts its self-representation to match the standards of an ideal self, but the actual self in terms of thought and behavior does not meet those standards, then the brain's free energy will be high. But if instead, as shown on the right, the brain changes its model to correctly predict the self-observation and the actual self, then the brain's free energy will be low. Secondly, an embodied brain can act in order to change its self-observations to be in accordance with its beliefs. This is the process of active inference. 
So again, for example, if as shown on the left, the brain predicts its self-observation to match the standards of the ideal self, but the actual self does not meet those standards, then the brain's free energy will be high, but the brain could then implement an action of some kind, such as engaging in counseling therapy, to change the actual self to be in accordance with the standards and predictions of the ideal self, as shown on the right. Thirdly, the brain can avoid this mental conflict entirely by simply losing awareness of this discrepancy between the actual and ideal selves to instead focus on some other external stimuli, some of which may be perceived as an exaggerated threat. In this model, the activity of the brain's recurrent predictive hierarchy serves as a neural correlate of objective self-awareness with the deep predictive units encoding information related to the ideal self, sensory input conveying information about the actual self and the superficial air processing, processing units encoding the prediction error, that is the difference between the actual and ideal selves. We are currently developing two ways to empirically test this combined objective self-awareness theory predictive processing framework. The first way is to try to compute the free energy of the brain during objective self-awareness. Objective self-awareness can be indexed through personality characteristic self-assessments and self-categorization tasks. Moreover, recently I have developed a computational method to estimate the free energy of the brain during perceptual categorization, and this method could be easily adapted to account for the case of self-categorization. So our intention is to combine these two methods to then compute the free energy of the brain during objective self-awareness. The second way we are developing to empirically test this framework is to examine the recurrent predictive connectivity within and between key brain networks that are correlated with self-awareness and violence. And we're, um, focusing our investigation on three such networks, the default mode network, the salience network, and the central executive network. The default mode network is active when a person is at wakeful rest, and it mediates self-referential processing, such as self-awareness, social processing, such as empathy, and moral decision-making. The central executive network is active when a person is engaged in a task, and it mediates information evaluation, self-regulation, and executive function. And the activity of the central executive network is anti-correlated with the activity of the default mode network. The salience network detects and integrates sensory and emotional states. It's involved in the control of the brain's reward system, as well as threat evaluation, it tracks pleasure, arousal, and distress, and it modulates this switch in activity between the default mode network and the central executive network. So its activity is anti-correlated with these two other networks. There is a wealth of evidence that violent behavior is linked to within network abnormalities and changes in activity and connectivity, as I list here. In addition, there is a wealth of evidence that violent behavior is linked to between network changes in activity and connectivity, as I list here. And in our work, we are exploring additional network interactions and their correlations with self-awareness and violent tendencies with an eye to modeling such interactions within the predictive processing, objective self-awareness theory framework. Finally, I would like to close my talk with a brief discussion of ways we are using this framework to guide the development of interventions for violent behavior. We are considering two interventional approaches. The first is mindfulness-based intervention, where violent individuals are taught mindfulness meditation in order to maintain objective self-awareness. This has been shown to increase one's ability to recognize and avoid situations that threaten one's sense of self. It also reduces sensitivity to loss of self-esteem and it improves the connectivity and function within these three brain networks that I have discussed. 
The second interventional approach is compassion-based intervention, where violent individuals are taught self-compassion in order to reconcile their actual and ideal selves through self-acceptance. Self-compassion is associated with a reduction in negative affect and impulsivity following a loss of self-esteem, and it improves the connectivity and function within these three brain networks that I have discussed. And if you are interested in learning more information about these different uh, ways we are exploring to intervene in violent behavior, I encourage you to attend and view a poster presentation that is, will be presented by my colleague, Dr. Richard Morley, here at this conference. And here at the bottom of the screen is information and the title for that presentation. Thank you for your attention to my talk. Thank you for visiting my talk on the Science of Consciousness conference online. I would like to uh, talk about a unifying theory of consciousness, which connects the underlying biochemical mechanisms in living systems. Before we get into that, I'd like to uh, introduce myself. My name is Rajneesh Khanna. I'm a plant photobiologist. Um, in the past several years, I've been working in the agriculture and food industries. Um, in 2015, I presented uh, this TEDx talk in Livermore, California on a local food application called Terra Local that we are developing, and we are about to launch it uh, in, in the next uh, few weeks. Um, iCultivare is a company that I started uh, about four or five years ago. Uh, it uh, connects uh, research and um, analytical needs of the agricultural industry with academia. Uh, Classlight is a software developed by uh, one of my colleagues, Greg Asner, and it uh, uses satellite images to monitor deforestation. So just, just a little few of the other things uh, that I am involved with, uh, but my interest is also in the hard problem of consciousness. And consciousness uh, is viewed by religion and science, uh, I think in slightly different ways. Uh, but then we find that psychedelics uh, connect uh, the, the two viewpoints in some way where science um, meets religion uh, in accepting in some way that uh, it is giving some sort of a uh, spiritual or some sort of a uh, experience that is also connected with uh, meditation and, and so forth. And there are many studies um, with brain scans uh, that are showing uh, images of how uh, the brain is um, reacting under psychedelic influence. And of course, so all of this is occurring in biology, which is taking place in the physical universe, in space time, uh, and quantum mechanics is playing a role. So to understand a problem like this, uh, I think we need to uh, be more inclusive of other sciences. Uh, the mathematics, physics, and, co and cosmology, which have done wonderful uh, jobs when in describing the universe uh, are more descriptive. I think we need some more experiential sciences such as philosophy and biology to participate in understanding uh, how consciousness works. So we will take a step directly into this presentation by looking at light. As a photobiologist, uh, I view light as a source of information. So light um, is packaged with information it carries information about direction, duration, intensity, and even color, the quality. Um, and the color, as you can see here, we've, I'm showing the visible light, uh, which is a very small spectrum of the entire radiation that's coming from the sun. But uh, the radiation uh, is packed with the information of frequency and wavelength and energy. So this information is what plants are capable, for example, in interpreting or unpacking. Uh, now, here we are looking at uh, a model organism called a Arabidopsis. These are seedlings of this plant Arabidopsis grown in darkness for four days or in continuous light, red light or far red light for four days. So you can see how differently uh, these seedlings grow in these different environments. In darkness, the seedlings are much longer, taller, uh, and they have a very prominent hook and the cotyledons have not opened. So we'll be focusing on these two organs, hypocotyls and cotyledons. Hypocotyls uh, are these, uh, these organs that are elongating the hypocotyl uh, or the uh, seedling and uh, with the prominent hook at the top. And you can see when these seedlings are grown in light, the hypocotyls are shorter and the cotyledons are more open and expanded. 
and this happens also in the far red light however in far red light we can see that there is no greening so red light uh, which is in, 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 uh, needed for photosynthesis can in, can start the chlorophyll biosynthesis pathway and cause greening which does not occur in far red light so uh, we can see clear differences in developmental uh, patterns of these uh, we can look at a little bit closer at this program of dark growth and light growth um, columbia is the uh, what we call the wild type version of the ceramidopsis which is the uh, normal uh, uh, response to uh, to the light signal let's say in this case and we are looking uh, closely at the cotyledons so you can see that in darkness uh, in all cases all the these uh, these three images that we are showing we can see there's a hook and the cotyledons have not expanded but we look at the wild type in red light the cotyledons are uh, well expanded open in far red light um, they are uh, not as expanded uh, but they are open now phi a and phi b represent two different photoreceptors these are uh, photoreceptors which will perceive red or far red light depending on the environment uh, of, of quality if there is more red light versus uh, less red light which can happen under shaded conditions uh, but we won't get into that but to simply to show that if we mutate one of these photoreceptors for example phytochrome a which is phi a we can see that in red light you get um, expanded cotyledons which means that the plant is able to sense red light even in the absence of phi a however it cannot sense far red light because in under far red light it grows as if it was in darkness so clearly then phytochrome a is involved in sensing far red light similarly phytochrome b which uh, is involved uh, amongst other photoreceptors in sensing red light so when phytochrome b is missing the activities of phytochrome c d and e which are the other phytochromes is ongoing so phytochrome b mutants which lack the function of phytochrome b will not expand their cotyledons as much as the wild type uh, will in red light whereas in far red light phytochrome b mutants uh, are able to uh, perform as uh, equally as well as the wild type columbia seedlings so in other words by mutating one gene we can alter the developmental program so now this connects us with an external signal such as light and its influence on the uh, organisms and the genetic makeup of the organism that plays an important role so uh, this these images are from one of my publications in 2003 and i was involved with this uh, another publication in 2004 so we can see how sensitive uh, plants uh, and other living organisms are to an external signal so let's look take a little bit closer look so that we can understand the underlying biochemical mechanisms that may that are involved in sensing signals that are coming to us from outside so let's look at darkness and we won't uh, you won't have to remember the names of these uh, these proteins or genes there is no test at the end uh, but we will just use the names so that we can orient ourselves within the uh, signaling pathway so here in darkness cop1 spa1 complex which is uh, which is a very important co complex which needs to be active uh, for the dark adaptation which we call scotomorphogenesis so the the dark uh, elongation of hypocortal uh, which is known also as etiolation as we saw up here this this process is called etiolation or scotomorphogenesis and then in light uh, we get photomorphogenesis so now here we're looking at the etiolation or scotomorphogenesis process where COP1 and SPA1 complex play an important role by suppressing the activity of this protein called HI5. And another protein, BBX32, also suppresses the activity of HI5. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, genes mentioned or proteins mentioned with the asterisk, uh, HI5 and PIF5 are the ones that I was involved in identifying um, uh, several years ago. Uh, but these, this process then keeps the HI5 program uh, off. So this off switch for this HI5 program uh, will keep the other uh, system, which is the PIF 1, 3, 4, and 5 system active, uh, which leads to transcription uh, or regulation of downstream genes and leading to scotomorphogenesis or this uh, growth pattern in darkness. So let's turn the lights on. Now when I turn the lights on, as we discussed before, there are 
different wavelengths of light, uh, the far red, red, and then blue and UV. And they're, they're all sensed by different photoreceptors. We discussed phytochrome A and phytochrome B. Uh, there are, for blue light, there are cryptochrome, phototropin, zyklope, and for UV, there is UVR8. So these different specific, very sophisticated uh, sensory mechanisms in plants, here we are talking about Arabidopsis, will then uh, activate the photomorphogenesis pathway or development in light pathway. And to do that, uh, they will suppress the COP1 SPA1 complex, activity of that complex, and inhibit the PIF1, PIF system uh, with all the PIF uh, proteins which uh, promote scotomorphogenesis. So by turning these pathways off, uh, then the high 5 pathway can be turned on. And high 5 uh, works uh, together with BBX20, 21, and 22 uh, to uh, promote photomorphogenesis. So this is the development in uh, in light, and as you can see, these seedlings, uh, these are uh, these have been grown in light, and they have shorter hypocotyls, and cotyledons are open. Uh, and so, this whole system, which has been divided in uh, in dark, a different mechanism, and in light, different mechanism, uh, shows us that how the developmental program is entirely different in the two light or dark regimes. So, what happens if we take a gene out? So, what is the consequence of a loss of function? Let's say of this COP1. COP1 uh, is, as I mentioned, an important uh, interface uh, which promotes scotomorphogenesis by suppressing HI5. So if we take COP1 out, if we mutate it, if we lose the function of COP1, what we expect is that its uh, effect on PIF system will be gone and also its suppression of the HI5 will be gone. So which means that we have turned off the off switch. There is no off switch now. What if we now take the light signal away? If there is no light signal and there is no off switch, obviously there is no regulation of the off switch, then one would expect that this system will be active, hi fi will be active, and it will promote photomorphogenesis, which means even in the absence of light, we will get this phenotype or the morphology of a light grown seedling. And Indeed, that is what we get. So we take COP1, which is known as constitutively photomorphogenic. It was uh, identified in 1992 by, by one of my colleagues. It was a uh, very big um, a discovery, uh, I would say, uh, in plant biology in 1992. Uh, and it showed us how uh, the photomorphogenesis can proceed when both the light signal and its off switch, COP1, are both absent. Right? So uh, to, to think about it in a way, I would suggest uh, if you have a car which is parked on a downhill slope uh, and you, your foot is on the brakes. So if you remove the brake, uh, you don't need gas. You are just going to roll down the hill by just removing the brake. So similarly, uh, the uh, photomorphogenesis program is sort of already programmed in the seedling and it's being uh, turned off by COP1. When you remove COP1, COP you don't need light, you don't need gas to go down that hill and you will get a photomorphogenesis, which also suggests that the survival of the seedling may depend upon light because ultimately, like we saw earlier, uh, for chlorophyll biosynthesis, you need photosynthetically active light. So light is needed uh, to survive. So the seedling uh, growing in the dark will grow as long as there is nutrients uh, within the uh, seeds or, or to support in the environment. Uh, but if the nutrients are depleted, then the plant cannot uh, photosynthesize and will not make it. However, we, all, we just saw that the growth, a different program of growth can occur uh, without light. So this, this is an important distinction. Now let's look at just the light pathway itself. So the light uh, pathway uh, has been conserved um, from ancient times, uh, even in prokaryotes, um, we can find photoreceptors, primitive forms of photoreceptors. Photo photoreceptors are present in animals and humans, and also obviously in plants. Um, and the downstream mechanisms are very similar. They involve molecular, chemical, and genetic uh, regulation, uh, transcription through transcription factors. There is protein stability. Stability of proteins is involved, uh, phosphorylation, and other types of protein modifications are involved and this is conserved throughout uh, evolution. So 
this system developed very early on uh, on how to perceive the signal which is outside how it is perceived and um, and transmitted to cause changes so now let's try a thought experiment in this thought experiment we will think about this development occurring in minkowski space time minkowski space time obviously takes into account uh, not just the x y and z dimensions but also the fourth dimension of time so and that's really um, where uh, development is occurring so at a very localized micro space uh, which is uh, which is uh, has these coordinates of x y and z uh, the development is occurring over moments of time so if we take uh, my example for uh, for here i'm sitting here uh, there is this uh, uh, if i walk back that way that will be let's say y axis and if i'm over here this is x axis but if i climb up one of these trees that's z axis but all of these things will be occurring in moments of time as i'm talking time is passing so uh, there is another movement of space time space through this time and so the thought experiment involves how uh, how does development occur through time and does it have anything to do with with evolution or with uh, uh, the fate of the uh, biological system so let's look at this we know there are several factors involved in uh, in driving or sustaining uh, life on earth uh, light of course is one uh, gravity which is constant mostly uh, except for maybe some uh, altitude and latitude differences air as well oxygen and carbon dioxide for plants is important temperature water and mineral nutrients and if you look at all of these light is represented with this symbol lambda um, and it is quite variable depending on where you are a quantity of light quality of light direction of light even duration of light can be quite variable gravity can be somewhat variable air is variable somewhat and temperature water and mineral nutrients can show quite a high degree of variation so with with this variable factors if we introduce those into this diagram now uh, we can see that light gravity and these ones these factors shown in green are um, are actually specific ones uh, that uh, our planet earth uh, provides uh, air uh, temperature water and uh, nutrients uh, which can be highly variable so uh, gravity is also a feature of earth so the only one factor that we are talking about is non earthly or or is coming from the sun all these other factors are uh, are provided by the nature of earth so light is an external signal but if light is not there the etulation process will will move uh, towards the direction of time um, and if light is there then photomorphogenesis and uh, the variation of light during the day which is shown over here with a uh, peak of intensity let's say in midday uh, so light varies quite a bit but then the what drives the movement of growth and development uh, through time so here i'm proposing that there is a need for another signal and the signal is hidden we don't uh, we don't have the ability to measure it yet and this hidden signal uh, i call uh, alf with the symbol alf and now we will try to look at why is there a need for this signal and i will try to uh, to show uh, a plausible link where the signal may be perceived uh, in living by living organisms so let's add uh, just for the sake of this talk let's add it in our uh, table uh, we we say a proposed signal which is alf written uh, with this symbol it is undetected i would say that it is present constantly and uh, i wouldn't get into the this aspect of why i think it is similar to light but not detected um, uh, but uh, it's out of the scope of this talk uh, but i i think that this will be similar in uh, many qualities such as uh, with, with light so uh, what happens in darkness that is the question uh, that we are going to address so in darkness we have cop1 spa1 complex like i mentioned before and what i'm proposing is that alif is an external signal which is present in the absence of light it's present all the time but when light is present light dominates so the light signaling pathway uh, inhibits or suppresses the effects of or influence of alif uh, alif is present constitutively and constantly it's a constant so alif uh, is acting in the absence of light 
and it's moving development through the uh, moments of time um, uh, without having any of the other factors. So it's, it's driving development to its fullest uh, potential without the influence of any of other factors presence. Okay, so growth through time is primed to change its develop developmental pattern uh, in the presence of favorable conditions, which means that Aleph's role is to prime growth and development so that it's prepared for the uh, other factors which are required for the survival of life. Okay, so th let's continue the thought experiment. If this is true, then Aleph maintains growth and developmental programs in space time to facilitate the organism's survival during uh, adaptive evolution. So it, it must have played a very fundamental role in what we understand about evolution. And as Herbert Spencer uh, stated, survival of the fittest, uh, uh, this is basically a growth and developmental program that is now adapting uh, to, the, to the environment that it is in uh, to maximize or to achieve nutrient inputs. So now if you go back to the, to the example of the downhill car, if you remove your brakes, uh, if you remove your brakes on a, on a flat surface, your car will not move anywhere. But it's only when your uh, car is uh, on the downhill surface, when you remove your brakes, then it will continue to uh, move downwards. Okay, so, so this is interesting. I think, uh, you know, obviously uh, the most uh, more commonly accepted reason for, for evolution to work is that our genetics is programmed as such that, uh, you know, uh, we, are, we are genetically programmed to uh, move continuously in developmental programs. And when we run into a challenging time, uh, millions and millions of times, uh, one mutation or several mutations occur and that they allow us to then overcome the challenge and we have evolved. Uh, if we think about the uh, down, downward hill again, uh, this is equal to your car coming down and finding a gas station. So if there's a gas station, you can put the gas in and you can move on. Uh, so what I'm proposing is that gas station itself is pretty complex. So uh, uh, the evolution is co-occurring in many different forms. There are systems that are being uh, developed through evolution and those systems then uh, are adapting uh, living organisms to deal with their environment or to um, meet the requirements uh, for the sustainability of life in their environment. So I think this complexity uh, that we find in evolution, which uh, is very hard to explain. Uh, and obviously there are people who uh, think uh, pro and con uh, in these terms, uh, but I would say that there is a need for a driver, that hill needs to be there for the developmental program to run its course uh, in, in a slightly directed way. So just, and it is, this idea is not that far-fetched, I would say, because we already have an example. Light is an external signal, which is clearly influencing growth and development. And 94 per 96%, nearly 96% of our universe, matter and energy, we don't know what it is. It is unknown. So it's not such a, a big leap to think that there is another external signal which is acting like light and it's influencing growth and development in the absence of light. That is simply uh, what the proposal is. And to, to draw it a little bit further, I wanted to find, is there a conserved ancient pathway? Just like light signaling is ancient, is there another ancient signaling pathway that we can think of where this signal might be acting? And I found one. I, I think shikimic acid pathway or the shikimet pathway uh, is a very good candidate for this. And the shikimet pathway is active in prokaryotes, fungi, algae, and plants. And actually in plants, it only occurs in plastids. So one can argue that it also has a prokaryotic origin, uh, but the shikimet pathway uh, is, uh, is involved in biosynthesis of aromatic amino acids like phenylalanine, tyrosine, tryptophan, and all the uh, psychedelic uh, molecules uh, that have uh, psychedelic effects on, on human brain, um, they're all derived from uh, one or more of these amino acids, especially tryptophan. So let's come back to that in a second, but let's look at the plant itself first. So in the plant, the shikimet pathway is making tryptophan in the plastid. Then the tryptophan uh, can take multiple uh, paths uh, to make uh, the phytohormone auxin. Auxin uh, counteractively acts uh, with light 
to regulate growth and development. Um, and it's, it's primarily involved in cell elongation. So making things longer uh, in opposition to light. Uh, and this is uh, very important, not only in uh, the scotomorphogenesis or the hypocortical elongation, but also uh, in shade avoidance that, also, that I mentioned briefly earlier. So the tryptophan pathway is working to uh, synthesize auxin in plants. We already know that light acts uh, on, on this particular mechanism over here, the SU2 gene to, uh, to suppress or reduce the amount of auxin that is being produced so that light can slow down cell, in, cell elongation. So light will enhance the activity uh, away from uh, the biosynthesis of auxin uh, towards this IGs, uh, but we won't get into all of that. And it also has other uh, regulatory uh, mechanisms that reduce the biosynthesis of auxin. So in my proposal, what I suggest is that this is only half of the story. Then the other half is the hidden signal, which I call LF, and that it acts through a ETO receptor, which is not known. So the hidden signal, we have not been able to uh, detect it yet. And then it will act through a similar mechanism where there'll be an ETO receptor. Most likely we know what uh, we have sequenced it and we are aware that that's, this molecule exists, but we don't know its function. So this ETO receptor will, will exist and that E2 receptor will regulate and increase in the biosynthesis of auxin. So in the absence of light, the, there will be an external signal that's driving uh, regular uh, growth and development, uh, priming uh, the organism to achieve uh, maximal inputs that are required for survival. So that, that is the idea, and that is the reason for Aleph and E2 receptor. So in this thought experiment, we discussed that there exists a hidden signal named Aleph. Uh, it drives localized space time through moments of time. Um, and the name Aleph is being used here just as a placeholder to suggest that there is a possibility of another signal. Uh, now, I, as I mentioned, 96% uh, of our universe is still unknown. Uh, I don't want to yet link uh, this to dark energy or, or what the, um, what the uh, signal might be. Uh, simply to say that Aleph is a potential signal uh, and a placeholder for this influencing uh, mechanism on growth and development. Uh, and more work is required to link it to some of the other possible mechanisms um, that, might, uh, that we are finding through other approaches in, in physics, uh, mathematics, and cosmology. And so this signal is perceived by a receptor, which I call ETO receptor, which is named after this etiolation. Uh, which is the elongation growth. So a photoreceptor, which is perceiving light. Similarly, there is going to be an E2 receptor, uh, which will uh, be receiving uh, this signal and then transmitting its information to uh, uh, regulate gene expression and other biochemical pathways to guide development towards the other factors uh, that, that might exist uh, in the given environment. So. Also, I also suggested that uh, this pathway uh, or this signal will be acting through uh, tryptophan pathway as at least one of the pathways. There might be additional pathways, uh, which, we, uh, which also requires more research. <clears throat> but I think that uh, Aleph would act on the tryptophan pathway. So linking this all, all of this back to consciousness or, or at least uh, our human brain, uh, we can see that tryptophan pathway is also uh, important. In, in human brains, and it, uh, it's needed for the synthesis of serotonin, melatonin, and niacin. Um, and uh, as you know, that uh, the uh, receptors uh, in our brain, uh, which uh, are targeted by serotonin, are the same receptors that psychedelics act on. So there, is a, there are similarities, uh, I would say, between all living organisms. And like I mentioned, um, uh, with the prokaryotic systems, uh, Shikimet pathway actually originated in prokaryotes. So the shikimet pathway is active in all living organisms and there seems to be uh, a missing signal and a missing receptor. Uh, so uh, with that, I would like to point out that uh, we are also doing a workshop on uh, plant mushrooms, medicine and consciousness. And this uh, workshop um, uh, will be uh, open uh, starting September 14th, uh, it'll be online. And uh, we have two talks, uh, one by Dan Horner, uh, one by me. And then we will have a, a great discussion uh, with uh, Dennis McKenna and Paul Stamets, 
on why do plants synthesize molecules with neuropsychoactive uh, properties. And uh, I, I highly recommend uh, watching this because both Dennis and Paul uh, brought in some recent data and, and it was really a pleasure to, uh, to hear uh, what their thoughts on why plants uh, make these substances and how um, uh, we can uh, benefit uh, from, from these plants. So uh, with that, I'd like to end uh, my talk. And if you would like to reach me, uh, here is my email address. You can visit my website. And thank you very much for listening. Hello, and welcome to my presentation. My name is Jessica Knötzele. I am a biology master student of Jürgen Kornmeier at the Albert Ludwigs University in Freiburg, which is located in the south of Germany. I will today present you my project with the title Do we perceive the world differently if we need to evaluate our percept? This EEG study was done in the Institute for Frontier Areas of Psychology and Mental Health in Freiburg. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. This famous sentence of René Descartes describes the term metacognition quite well. Metacognition means the ability of human beings to think about thinking, to have knowledge about our knowledge and to reflect about our actions. One level below metacognition there is the metaperception and I will explain you this shortly on an example. So on the left hand side you can see an ambiguous NECA cube. This NECA cube can be presented to a person. This person then perceives this Necker cube either orientated to the right or orientated to the left. This is called the perception. One level above the perception there is the meta-perception. Meta-perception means the evaluation of the interpretation of the sensory information in this perception part. So meta-perception means that we now think about how sure we are about our percept before. So for example, with this Necker cube, it's an ambiguous figure, so we can perceive it either orientated to the left or orientated to the right. So by looking at it, we run into trouble because there are two different ways to perceive it. Meta-perception, so the evaluation of the perception, leads us to our main research question, which was do we perceive the world differently if we need to evaluate our percept? So we wanted to know if there's any difference in the perception here and here. So is there a difference if we have after the perception to explicitly do meta-perception? So if we have to explicitly evaluate our perceptual interpretation in the first step and think how sure we are about this percept, and now we wanted to have a look if there's the difference if we have this perception with the explicit meta-perception versus if we have only the perception without an explicit meta-perception afterwards. To answer this question, we used the following paradigm. We had two different kinds of lattices, unambiguous lattices in two variants, orientated to the left and orientated to the right, in blue and ambiguous lattices, here shown in red. The first condition was the rating condition, indicated by an R. The rating condition starts by presenting a stimulus for 800 milliseconds. Then, for 800 milliseconds, a white cross appears on the screen. Here, task 1 takes place. Task 1 is the perceptual response. So the subjects had to give an orientation answer how they perceived this lattice before, so orientated to the left or to the right. The white cross changed into red, and this last is for 2000 milliseconds. Here, task 2 takes place. Task 2 was the evaluation response, or the rating response. So the subject had to rate from 1, which means 100% sure, to 4, which means not sure at all how sure they are about their perceptual interpretation from task 1. A small break of 200 milliseconds black screen followed and then everything started all over again. So 
The second condition was called the no rating condition, indicated by NR. It starts again by presenting a stimulus for 800 milliseconds followed by task 1 for 800 milliseconds, but then the both conditions start to differ. So in the no rating condition, there is no task 2, so no rating response. That's why after task 1, the next stimulus comes, and so on. So the lattices occur in a completely random order, so this is just an example how it could look like. So we did an ERP analysis and um, calculated difference traces. ERPs are event-related potentials, and those are measured brain responses as a direct result of a specific event, and um, electrophysiological responses to a stimulus. So the stimulus can be, for example, an auditory stimulus or a visual stimulus. And the ERPs are measured by the means of EEG. So here we can see an ERP graph. On the x-axis we have the time in seconds. Zero seconds means here is the stimulus onset. And we have the amplitude in microvolt on the y-axis. So in this time window we are looking at the time when the subjects are perceiving or seeing one of those lattices on the screen. Here this is an example for the rating condition. So we calculated the grand mean over all 17 participants for the rating condition and in this example for the n biggest lattices. Here's the same shown for the no rating condition. So again we have the grand mean over all participants and um, again for the n biggest lattice. And if we now want to calculate the difference trace, we need to subtract one trace by the other. So we did subtract the no rating trace of the rating trace and the solid line here is the result of this and it is called the difference trace. And from now on in the following slides I will only use the difference traces and I will not show you the um, lines or the traces for the rating and the no rating conditions separately. So here we are looking at difference traces over all electrodes I used in the study. So I used 32 electrodes and they are distributed over the head as it is shown here. So we have the nose here and the back of the head here. And we have on the right hand side the right ear and we have on the left hand side the left ear. And if we are looking now at all traces we can see in blue again the unambiguous and red the ambiguous that all traces differ from zero. So when you remember we are looking at different traces. So any deviation of zero means that we have a difference between condition rating and condition no rating. So we have quite big differences for both stimuli for every electrode. Moreover, we can see that the two different stimuli, so ambiguous and unambiguous, only slightly differ from each other. So in the difference traces from the slide before, we identified different components at different time points, and this is what I will show and explain you now in the results. So the first component was component one. If you have a look at this timeline here, we can see that we have the time in seconds and the stimulus onset at time point zero, and already 104 milliseconds after the stimulus onset, the component one started. So this is the time point when the trace deviated significantly from zero for the first time. So here we can see a voltage map and um, on the voltage map we can see the distribution of the electrodes over the head. So again we have here the nose and we have here the back of the head. We can see that we have a negative amplitude around the occipital cortex around the OZ electrode. So here we have an ERP graph again with the time in seconds on the x-axis, amplitude to microwatt on the y-axis for the OZ electrode here. So here 
I indicated the time point, so 104 milliseconds after the stimulus onset, where the trace deviated from zero the first time significantly. We can see here in the negative area that we have quite sharp peaks, and we did a peak analysis from 0 0.05 to 0 0.2 seconds, so shown by this grayish background here. The results of the peak analysis are shown here in the scatter plot. On the x-axis we have the lattices, so unambiguous on the left-hand side and ambiguous on the right-hand side. On the y-axis we have the amplitude to microvolt of component 1. Here every dot shows the results of one subject and if you remember we are looking at different traces. So every deviation of the amplitude of 0 means that we have a difference between rating and no rating condition. So we can see here that we have a difference for every subject for both stimuli between condition rating and condition no rating. The second component was shortly after the first component, here around 172 milliseconds after the onset of the stimulus. Looking at the voltage map, we can see that we have a high brain activity over the anterior part of the brain, so around the CZ electrode. Here we can see the ERP graph for the CZ electrode. We have two positive peaks for ambiguous and unambiguous, and it is in the same time window as before, so from 0.05 to 0.2. That's why we use the same time window for the peak analysis for component 2. So here on the scatter plot again we can see that all participants amplitudes differ from zero so we can say that we have a difference between condition rating and condition no rating for all participants for both stimuli. The third component was at about 324 milliseconds after stimulus onset and um, at the voltage map we can see that it has a high brain activity over the parietal cortex, so around the PZ electrode. Here we can see the ERP graph for the PZ electrode and um, here we can see the peaks. In this time window we use now a window from 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 to do the peak analysis. Here we can see again the scatter plots and for all subjects we have a difference between rating and no rating condition. So now I will come to the last component, to component 4. And component 4 has a much bigger time window than the other components from 0 0.6 seconds to 1.0 seconds. When we have a look at the voltage map, we can see that we have a high brain activity around the CZ electrode, and for the CZ electrode, we have here the ERP graph. When we are looking at the time window here, we can see that there is no really sharp peak as for the components before, but we can see that both traces differ from zero for the whole time in this window and around a similar amplitude, so that's why we calculated the average amplitude and instead of the peak analysis. And here we can see that again for all subjects we have differences between condition rating and no rating. So the last result I will show you today are the reaction times for task 1. So if you remember task 1 was the um, orientation response. This um, task 1 was present in the rating condition and in a no rating condition. So if we have a look at the scatter plot, we can see the conditions on the x-axis. We have the ambiguous on the left, the unambiguous on the right-hand side, and always the rating condition left here and here, and the no rating condition right here and here. And we have the median reaction time in milliseconds on the y-axis. If we now compare the two conditions, so rating versus no rating, within one stimuli, we can see that we have significantly higher reaction times in the rating condition than in the no rating condition for ambiguous and for unambiguous. So component 1 had a very early start at already 104 milliseconds after the onset of the stimulus and was located around the occipital cortex which indicates an early visual processing. 
the a priori knowledge about the evaluation task, so task 2 in the rating condition, seemed to amplify the early visual processing of the stimulus. So component 2 was shortly after component 1, so at around 172 milliseconds after the onset of the stimulus, and showed a high brain activity over the anterior part of the brain. And here probably the evaluation of the perceptual decision started. The third component showed a parietal positivity at around 324 milliseconds after the onset of the stimulus. And this may represent a variant of the P3B ERP component. This component is discussed in the literature as a signature of context updating. And in the current study, it could reflect a conscious evaluation decision. So the last component was component 4, which showed a sustained positivity from 600 to 1000 milliseconds after the onset of the stimulus. When we are now looking at the rating condition, the evaluation result needed to be kept in working memory until the evaluation response, so until task 2 in the rating condition. And this is maybe reflected by this sustained positivity. In general, we can say that we only have small differences between ambiguous in red and unambiguous in blue lattices, but we have very large differences between the two conditions, rating and no rating. So if you remember from before, we are looking at difference traces, and every deviation of zero means that we have a difference between rating and no rating. So it doesn't matter how the subject grades, it doesn't matter if the subject is either sure or unsure of its perception, it only does matter that the subject has to rate. We have one limitation in our study, which was that the interstimulus time is not the same in both conditions. So when we look again at the paradigm, we can see for the no rating condition that we only have task one in between two stimuli and in the rating condition, we have task 1 plus task 2 and a short break of 200 milliseconds. So in total, we have only 800 milliseconds in the no rating condition, but 3000 milliseconds in the rating condition in between two stimuli. So the results of our study gives some indications to answer to our main research question. We can now say that if we need to evaluate our perceptual interpretations explicitly, that we then can see at component 1 that the early visual areas start to process the visual stimulus differently already 104 milliseconds after the onset of the stimulus. The cognitive processing, so possibly the perceptual evaluation, takes place 172 milliseconds after the onset of the stimulus, so here at component 2, and it may come to a result at about 324 milliseconds after the onset, so the third component here. The last component, component 4, showed us that keeping the evaluation result in a working memory enhances the ERP in a sustained manner over more than 400 milliseconds. Moreover, we could find that the reaction times in the rating condition are significantly higher than in the no rating condition, even if we are looking at the same task. Overall, the necessity to evaluate our perceptual interpretation in an explicit way changes the whole perceptual processing chain. This differential processing starts at a remarkably early step already 104 milliseconds after the onset of the stimulus. We can say that one and the same visual stimulus seems to be perceived differently if we need to report how sure we are with our perceptual interpretation. So in other words, the explicit meta-perception changes our perception. One of the fundamental insights from quantum physics says that measuring a system changes a system. So if we apply this to our study regarding the perceptual evaluation task, so task 2 in the rating condition, 
as a measurement of the perceptual outcome, then the current results may be interpreted as a support for recent theoretical developments in the related field of quantum cognition. So I will thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, please let me know. You can find my email address at the bottom. Hello, everyone. Thank you for watching my presentation. I'm Yuta Nishiyama from Japan. Uh, I do researches on applied informatics uh, concerning animal behavior and human cognition to reveal the nature of creativity and adaptability through understanding a relationship between parts and whole of living systems. Uh, one of the subjects of my study is sense of body ownership. About that, uh, I've been developing experimental settings where participants experienced the strange body perception like body disownership feeling and uh, like walking with invisible body. And in this presentation, uh, I'm gonna talk about the uh, sense of body ownership, disownership, and also loss of ownership feelings. Okay, uh, since develop development of a simple but revolutionary experimental paradigm, uh, rubber hand illusion, a wide range of studies on multisensory integration have tackled a consciousness issue uh, through understanding what it's like to be me. In the classic rubber hand illusion, uh, participants were seated in front of a table on which a fake hand was placed and the partition screened out the view of the real hand. And then an experimenter uh, stroked both fake hand and those of uh, and uh, the real hand by a brush. So participants are able to see the brush stroking on the fake hand and also feel touch of the brush stroking uh, on their own real hand. Then synchronous uh, visual tactile stroking uh, makes them feel the sense of ownership over the fake hand as their own body part. Similarly, extended version of rubber hand illusion uh, allows inducing full body illusion like out of body experience. So far, many studies have reported uh, synchronous stimuli on various types of mod modalities can cause sense of body ownership of over an um, alternative object or space. A typical idea of inducing the sense of body ownership is uh, multisensory uh, integration. Multimodal stimuli uh, organize some kind of body sensation in bottom-up manner. In the meanwhile, it's decided uh, whether the bottom-up feeling is consistent with top-down recognition regarding possible alternatives satisfying the constraints such as uh, temporal synchronicity and physical congruency. Being consistent between them uh, elicit the uh, sense of ownership as an emergent property of this embodied system. Here, uh, real body and external objects uh, provide expected framework and 
one or some of them are finally chosen uh, as the owned. On this idea, the loss of ownership is just given to something not to be chosen as long as focusing on ownership of alternatives. So sense of ownership and loss of ownership is the negation each other in, in this expected framework. However, I'd like to consider actually how we were aware of the sense of ownership when performing body ownership illusion. So please remember the uh, feeling during rubber hand illusion if you have it done. Uh, as for me, uh, that illusion made me feel something more than just owning a body. Uh, during the illusion, I was recognizing that the object in front of me was obviously not my body, but at the same time, uh, feeling the touch exactly on the object. In other words, my feeling was like, it's my hand, even though it's not my hand. Okay. I guess such discrepancy uh, between recognition and uh, sensation is the sense of body ownership. So let me show you uh, uh, my idea about inducing sense of ownership. Uh, there is a gap uh, between bottom-up uh, sensation and the top-down recognition. In there, the sense of ownership is not elicited in single uh, consistent framework, but rather across multiple uh, frameworks like coming from outside of single framework. So both distinction and the confusion of frameworks uh, bring about the uh, sense of body ownership. But not that uh, uh, being my body uh, is coming to the front in this case. Uh, it implies that not being my body can be front uh, so as to represent the sense of disownership. In fact, uh, the disownership feeling of one's own body can be psychologically induced in simple uh, experimental settings like this. Uh, so let's say uh, you are a participant in this experiment, uh, then you are seated uh, sideways in front of camera and presented with uh, live images of one side of your body through head-mounted display, like this panel. Uh, you will immediately notice the person who are projected is you in real time. Uh, like in a mirror, except lateral view, uh, because your movements are reflected on the images uh, with almost no delay. In this situation, uh, if you move your arm hiding elbow behind your upper body, it's called hide condition you will be able to move your arm, your own will, but uh, uh, it will no longer look like your, uh, yours, kind of a prank picture. This strange feeling is the sense of disownership, uh, like it's not my body, even though it's my body. By contrast, uh, in the control, uh, control condition, your elbow is displayed 
before your upper body uh, all the time uh, and uh, uh, strange sensation never happens. So this visual discontinuity of the uh, body uh, between arm and upper body uh, causes the sense of disownership apparently. In addition, we investigated effects of this ownership feeling on pain. Pain is absolutely uh, subjective perception. So measurement is nothing but participant's subjective report, but we can measure the degree of pain as, uh, as much quantitatively as possible. One of the methods is to determine the uh, pain threshold value by using some, uh, thermal stimulator, which can gradually increase the uh, probe temperature. And uh, so participants uh, stop the temperature rise uh, by pushing the button when they feel pain. The temperature at uh, which they stopped the operation is pain threshold value. So in this experiment, uh, the settings were the same as the previous one, uh, but participants uh, put their uh, elbow on an armrest uh, for the position of variable to be fixed. This uh, video yeah, shows an example of trials. Uh, he closed and opened the, uh, his left hand to the rhythm uh, for three minutes. After that, uh, pain threshold measurement was carried out uh, four times, and then those values were averaged across conditions. Here are the results. Uh, this panel shows uh, questionnaire results. The item one is, uh, I felt as if the hand was an artificial product corresponding to an indirect expression of this ownership feeling. And the item five is, I felt as if the hand was not my own, corresponding to a direct uh, expression of the uh, this ownership feeling. These ratings, uh, one and five, demonstrated that subjective disownership feeling more or less happened uh, as well as the previous psychological experiment. And this ownership feeling uh, uh, didn't uh, directly in indicate any correlation with pain threshold values, but there is positive correlation between pain threshold and feeling of shrunk arm asked in this uh, uh, question item two, I felt as if the arm shrunk. Uh, so please look at this diagram. Uh, note that uh, plots are represented by differences uh, between uh, uh, conditions. Uh, this indicates stronger feeling of shrunk arm uh, shows higher pain threshold. So there might be uh, analgesic effects of this feeling of shrunk down. So body representations associated with this ownership feeling uh, might modulate pain perception. In fact, some previous studies have reported that visually manipulating body size can moderate pain perception. Uh, Mosley et al. 
2008 uh, reported that patients with chronic pain, highly rated pain, uh, when they looked at their enlarged arm, and conversely, uh, gave lower pain uh, uh, ratings uh, to shrunk arm. And Ramachandran et al. 2009 uh, showed that a patient with a uh, phantom limb uh, gave low pain ratings to shrunk arm. But uh, no change to enlarged arm. These two are clinical studies. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Mancini at our 2011 demonstrated in healthy participants, enlarged arm was more analgesic and shrunk arm was less analgesic than normal. Moreover, uh, Romano and Maravita uh, 2014 showed both distorted arm uh, caused stronger pain anticipation to close threat, uh, but only enlarged arm uh, reduced response to contact stimuli. Uh, let's summarize. Uh, then, uh, roughly speaking, uh, the former two uh, clinical cases uh, uh, suggest that big arm is more painful and small arm is not so painful. By contrast, uh, in the latter two healthy participant studies, uh, big arm is uh, less painful and, uh, 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 and small arm is more painful. Uh, this understanding might be too rough, uh, but it's interesting uh, how people usually represent uh, their body, their body uh, influences pain perception when their body representation has changed because of visual size change. As for uh, relationship between body representation and pain perception, uh, the results of our study uh, mentioned in the previous slide seem to be closer to clinical studies. So this ownership feeling in our study may simulate uh, disruption of body representation as seen in uh, these pathological conditions. But uh, we should be aware uh, it's possible to come from differences in experimental procedure uh, because participants uh, moved or intended to move their arm in the uh, clinical studies and uh, our study, but uh, no any movements in healthy participants studies in this case. Anyway, uh, let's go back to uh, our schematic diagram about the sense of ownership. The sense of ownership is uh, a feeling like it's my body, uh, even though it's not my body. And the sense of disownership is a feeling like it's not my body, even though it's my body. This awareness are like two sides of the same coin. The side is uh, decided according to which of recognition or sensation is more influential in the context. What's important is there being the gap uh, between recognition and sensation to be distinguished and confused. On this idea, uh, the loss of ownership is no longer a simple negation of ownership. Instead, in the sense of uh, uh, figure ground relationship, uh, like figure ground relationship, uh, loss of ownership is a background 
to be aware of ownership and disownership feelings as a uh, figure. Okay, there being a gap uh, in recognition sensation framework uh, may be common uh, even in the, our daily life. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, feeling like ownership uh, during rubber hand illusion uh, leaves a vivid impression on me. So I like to call such feeling a re reality. Okay, uh, please let me tell you my story. Uh, one night, uh, I was walking that street. Uh, there was another pedestrian uh, uh, about five meters before me. Uh, when we were going through an underpass, my steps synchronized with the person's steps by chance. Uh, then I was able to look at the uh, person uh, behind and also hear the echo of our footsteps in the underpass. That situation made, uh, made me feel uh, both I'm moving the person and I'm being moved by the person. My footsteps of that time uh, became awkward and I felt as if I, I was relearning how, uh, how to walk. Of course, I don't remember the first time I could walk though. Uh, such gap uh, can happen at any time uh, to a greater or lesser extent. Okay. In conclusion, uh, our reality of the world uh, might be brought about from outside of our cognitive frameworks by distinguishing and confusing uh, top-down and bottom-up uh, processes. Okay, finally, uh, my idea introduced in this talk is uh, inspired by Professor uh, Yukiopegio Gunji's idea. Okay, so thank you for listening uh, and uh, 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 I'm hoping uh, uh, you all stay healthy. Thank you so much. Bye bye. I'm glad to meet those who want to know who we are and what is everything. Today I will present a scheme which shows the causal effectiveness of consciousness, mind, mental phenomena all phenomena which have subjective nature. Immediately I ask you to pay attention to my scheme. The mechanism of processing of information presented in the scheme is the basic for understanding of the seven paragraphs postulated in my abstract as possible holistic concept of understanding of the general brain activity. So, to the theory itself, practically all neurophysiological investigations are based on predominantly physical parameters of activity of neuronal networks of the brain. And at the same time, neurophysiological, neurochemical, neuromolecular, neuronic, etc. processes expressed in physical quantities are considered by default the, uh, to realize biologically or socially expedient informational functions. However, scientific ex experience claims that uh, physical processes are inherently indifferent to a person's biological or social existence. Hence, we don't know in what way brain informational activity is biologically or socially expedient. But we know that our brain implements the informationally well-endowed and at the same time 
biologically or socially expedient motor acts. Example. My today's speech, being a series of motor acts, isn't devoid of social and a little bit biological experience. And this occurs despite the fact that my brain is physically active. Next question. Why in our brain the processing of information is totally accompanied by mental phenomena? Mental images, emotions, deliberations, those, etc. Why we are totally saturated uh, with our subjectivity? Why exactly in our consciousness, not in neuronal networks by themselves? It is fundamentally possible to reproduce the past that already isn't really now exist. Why our brain creates mental pictures of a subjectively desired future that doesn't not yet exist. Besides, I have reason to say to say that such a brain, being totally physical, is fundamentally incapable to realize such sophisticated phenomenon as informationally well endowed motor acts. Here is a contradiction. Physics by itself cannot process and integrate it, uh, and integrate memory. Cannot see possible future. Cannot operate information in the virtual regime. And now um, I ask you to be attentive uh, to picture. This is a very general scheme showing the neuronal networks of the brain stretching from sensory input to motor output, including most important feedback, feedback loops. Uh, I repeat, from sensory input to motor acts with many uh, feedback loops. Let's now sim simplify the task and ask ourselves, what does the brain do? It only percepts information, accumulates and stores information, combines, integrates information in the parts of the brain, to which information flows from other parts of the brain. And yet, in spite of physicality of neuronal processes, they carry out all of these three uh, basic information operations, operations precisely, uh, biologically or socially expedient. Fortunately, we are no longer, no longer li living in the time of the cut. And we, we already know, after Petfield, that the limbic region of our brain implements the phenomenon of subjective value. Our subjective bias towards something. Our ability to evaluate, uh, to evaluate uh, something uh, qualitatively in terms of good or bad, pleasure or, for example, displeasure. Thus, I propose to call these structures the governing structures, the controlling structures, such as, uh, uh, structures. Uh, see uh, the scheme. And uh, such structures um, symbolized um, uh, are symbolized in uh, in uh, uh, at the picture 
by the Istanbul Control Neuronal Network. And it is precisely because these physically functioning structures realize mental phenomena of subjective value and decision making. making. Here I mean, first of all, the limbic region and the frontal cortex, which manage the rest of the brain. Indeed, it is precisely in our subjective value is fixed our ability to percept, to integrate uh, fragments of memory, full thinking, exactly biologically or social experience. That's why, as for me, subjective value is the operator of processing information in the brain. For example, my brain makes me uh, ma makes my motor acts biologically adequate. My love for my country makes me socially active and socially thinking. Another key characteristic of neural networks of the brain is neural networks of the brain and its structures are started with feedbacks between networks of various structures of the brain. That's why in our scheme totally all neuronal connections are represented as paired and these pairs are multidirectional. And they are multidirectional in sensory pathways uh, to control neural networks, to big brain, uh, to motor acts, uh, uh, in, uh, in pathways of motor acts uh, from control neural networks. And we can judge about such hierarchical structure through knowing what exact mental phenomena realize this brain structure. For example, amygdala, uh, it is fair. frontal cortex, it is decision making, etc., etc. But what is the fundamental function of this general all brain hierarchy? In the bottom up direction, controlling neural networks receive information from the controlled uh, neural networks by means of mental integrated through subjectivity information complexes. First of all, uh, mental images. Controlled neural networks, in this case, are sensory networks, networks that, that store information, uh, store memory, and networks that implement motor acts. But in the opposite top-down direction, the controlling neuronal networks may control the process, uh, the processes in the subordinate neuronal networks through the phenomenon of subjective value and already integrated information by changing physical structure of, uh, of uh, them. <clears throat> and it is exactly this process that allows controlling neuronal networks to acquire information competence sufficient to manage controlled neuronal networks, including motor cortex, which determines motor acts allowing them to implement purposeful behavior um, based on integrated experience. And now, some words about the most essential scientific, as for me, maybe philosophical characteristic of this scheme. <clears throat> on my picture, you, see, uh, you can see the standards of various size. 
They include similar standards of light red color. This means that each neural network symbolized uh, by a rectangle implants its own physic pheno uh, uh, psychic phenomena or psychic phenomena. But in the process of mutual mental integrating causation of networks, a certain integral general mental process of information processing arises, given to us introspectively. According to William, William James, stream of consciousness. Within this causally, causally independent of physics, flow of information processing, causal factor of subjective value op operates providing freedom of choice in the framework of the continuum of information fixed in the brain. Now we are ready to speak about free choice as an aspect of information processing in the brain. Indeed, subjective value is not only a factor that directs all information processes to biological or social way. Besides, subjective value is a fact factor of the free selection of the necessary information from the continuum of subject's memory. There is no subjective value, there is no need to choose. To choose memory fragments, to choose a direction of perception, for example, to choose uh, motor acts, etc., etc. But what does it mean to select needed information from the continuum of your personal memory, fix it in your uh, brain, in order to combine it with other fragments of your memory? It means the process of integration of information in the sense of Juliet Anon. Thus, the subjective value is the factor of free manipulation of information in the brain, neural networks, and that's why it is the factor of forming of new information in response to environmental models. Thereby, causality which acts in the consciousness sphere is not physical because physical causality cannot implement processing information in the biological, biological or socially expedient way, cannot carry out freedom. And the main function of this virtual sphere is the detection and implementation into reality of new causal connections that ensure the achievement by living systems of new levels of non-equilibrium dynamic steady states or higher, le higher levels of uh, self-organization based on information integration and accumulated free energy in the brain. Maybe I will slightly disappoint those who think of consciousness as the most fundamental ontology. I can also disappoint those who want to reduce the mental to the physical. Although I myself favor palm proto psychism, I still consider the physical world to be more fundamental than any hypostasis of subjectivity, at least because the subjectively 
uh, excuse me, because of the subjectivity, implements only an informational function. Subjectivity is only an instrument of being of living bodies. More exactly, of being of living, living physical bodies. Big thanks for your attention.